people of the internet, welcome to Modern Day Debate. Tonight we are debating the flat or the globe Earth, and we are starting right now. I am Kaz, host, I'm Kaz, host of the Atheist Edge. Tonight we have Witsit Gets It versus Tony, and each person is going to get 10 minutes for their opening statements. And I believe, Witsit, you're going to go first. So, Witsit, at your first word, I will start your timer. The floor is all yours. Oh. How's it going? Um, I'm going to share that presentation there, if that's cool. Oh, okay. I'll stop your timer one second. All right, let me get that off the screen. All right, whenever you're ready. Cool. All right. So here we go. Do where do we live? Globe or flat is what I see the debate is called. So we'll get into it. So here's the overview. We'll cover the proper way to logically navigate the subject, followed by a logical examination of the two propositions. So we have a three-part presentation: fallacies, the globe, and then the true earth. So we have uh, fallacies are invalid arguments. That's what a fallacy, a logical fallacy means that it is an argument that is not valid. So we're going to go through some of the basics. We have the ad hominem fallacy attacking the person instead of the argument. Um, for example, flat earthers just don't understand basic science. Uh, the credentials fallacy dismissing an argument by asserting the person who made the argument doesn't have the proper credentials. Uh, for example, you don't have a degree in this subject. Uh, straw man fallacy, attacking a misrepresentation of the other person's argument. Why don't we fall off the edge of your space pizza? Appeal to majority. Uh, argument for an unproved conclusion based on the beliefs of a large group of people. Uh, example, 7 billion people believe the earth's a ball, but you think you're right. Uh, appeal to authority. Argument that because a perceived authority believes something to be true, it must be true. An example, all scientists agree the earth is a globe. Uh, poisoning the well. Using ad hominem attacks to preemptively discredit the opponent. Example, all flat earthers are science denying religious conspiracy theorists. <laughs> and we have begging the question fallacy. When an argument's premise assumes the truth of the conclusion, the globe model says the sun goes beneath the earth. So sunsets prove the earth's a globe. Um, and we have shifting the burden of proof, flipping the burden to the person who denies or questions the assertion being made. This is a very important one in this conversation. It happens all the time. Uh, for example, prove the images from space are not real. <laughs> you don't prove negatives. You're, we're challenging the assertion being made. And uh, those are important to keep in mind during the debates. They seem to be frequently occurring in this discussion. Okay, so we'll cover the globe, some of the basics. It's a very specific model claim. So we have the overview. It has three primary foundational claims that must be verified. One is curvature, two is motion, and third is the vacuum of space. So we have the curvature of the globe model makes very specific dimension claims. If these dimensions are falsified, the entire model is falsified. Quite literally, everything that the globe model is built upon uses the R value. Um, one of these examples of how this has occurred is we actually have an arc of vision. We see in a circle, we have circular eyes. We cannot see forever, contrary to certain people's opinions. So this is how we view uh, visual space around us. So we have our zenith and we have our horizon and we take different angle measurements to the sky. So here you go. This is a depiction of what would be called an azimuthal grid. You have your azimuth, your horizontal direction here at the bottom. Then you have your altitude to different stars and you have your zenith. And then we take these different positions. And what it gives us is a, a celestial hemisphere, effectively, an azimuthal grid of observability. This is the very thing that was used to engineer the dimensions of the globe. So if you then say the sky matches the globe model, that proves the globe. That is a textbook begging the question fallacy. Again, when an argument's premise assumes the truth of the conclusion, it is literally built upon the sky. We went and looked at the sky and we made measurements and then engineered a globe earth model based on those observations. To then turn and point at the sky and say, look, it matches the globe earth model is very fallacious. The second one, motion. The globe model claims that the Earth is a tilted, wobbling, rotating 1,037 miles per hour and revolving around the sun 66,600 miles per hour. At the same time, it is claimed that the Earth flies through the galaxy 500,000 miles per hour and through the universe 1.3 million miles per hour. So this is a claim that has to be verified. I have the wrong picture here, but of course, this is a positive claim that we are in fact spinning. And in fact, it's antithetical to all observations and direct attempts to measure these claims. Uh, 
per Einstein. But when I was a student, I saw that experiments of this kind had already been made, in particular by your compatriot Mickelson. He proved that one does not notice anything on Earth that it moves, but that everything takes place on Earth as if the Earth is in a state of rest. So again, if we are denying or questioning the assertion being made that the Earth is tilted, wobbling, spinning, revolving, flying through space, and then you tell us, oh, well, we can never actually measure it. Everything on the Earth happens as if the Earth is rest. We don't have some type of um, you know burden to prove that it's not moving. Okay, um, next we have the vacuum of space. The globe model claims that the Earth's atmosphere exists within a vacuum without the air pressure equalizing into the available space. So here's a depiction of the globe model and what it claims. Of course, this verify uh, <laughs> violates natural law as gas will always fill the available space. Gas pressure, air pressure, same thing. Air at most means gas. So it would fill the available space. This is contrary to uh, natural law to claim that it just sits within a vacuum. So you would have to actually be able to verify a mechanism that would cause that and simply saying the word gravity as if a deity doesn't do that. Of course, here's a depiction of something being flat. Seems we have to cover the basics so everyone gets it. Flat earth. Flat is not a shape. It is a description of a surface. It is an object is is flat, then it's called a plane shape. So more specifically, Earth is a topographical plane. So all of these on the right here are flats. These are plane shapes. Flat is not a shape, okay? You can have tons of different shapes that are flat. It's a general description of the surface. Of course, globe is a shape claim. Here are some evidences of flat Earth. We have mirror flash tests. So from long distances, this is from, I think, uh, roughly 18 miles. We used infrared, and you see the mirror flash and don't see it, and it goes through the horizon. So how does that work? That there's the horizon that's supposedly a curvature of the earth, which is the water. And then we see an infrared, a mirror flash from like just 1.5 meters off the ground. We see a mirror flash come through the horizon consistently when it's on the beach. So that doesn't seem to make sense. If even if it was refraction, how's it going through the horizon once it reflects with line of sight that debunks the globe? That's flat earth evidence that establish a horizontal line of sight as to long distance laser tests, or we can just believe that all, every time something debunks the globe, the, the laser always bends at the perfect exact rate of the curvature of the earth, which is just an unfounded claim. We also have tsunamis that never wrap around Antarctica. Here's a depiction. So we actually have a very famous one in 1960. The earthquake lasted 11 minutes. It was a couple days worth of crazy waves and tsunamis, and they actually seem to bounce back from the Antarctic region. Now on a globe, of course, there's a very well-known phenomenon within tsunamis, tsunamis that they wrap around land masses, but they never, ever wrap around Antarctica. That's supposedly a land mass on the bottom of a ball. And I know that some people like to push earthquakes and tsunamis, and hopefully we get into that because I just can't wait. So there's a debunk of the globe that can't happen. You would have earthquake, you would have tsunamis wrap around the Antarctic continent. So I would love to see some evidence of that. We also have ties, amphidromic points, also known as tidal nodes. So according to the globe Earth, we actually have a moon that's locked, tidally locked with the Earth, causing the Earth to have tides and actually pulls the water behind it. That would be an even distribution of gravity causing the, gra the tides on the Earth. But we have points all over the Earth called amphidromic points that are tidal nodes. In fact, extreme concentrations in them and there's not an agreed upon explanation even theoretically within the globe model other than to claim that some of them are close to oceanic basins. So there's actually not an answer. This makes no sense other than on a flat earth. It makes perfect sense. We have the magnetic field. I think I have three minutes left. So um, here is an example of one of the problems with the globe Earth's magnetic field. We have a uh, <laughs> lack of symmetry in the southern hemisphere. Now, of course, on a geodynamo model with a magnetic field, you would have the same magnetic field in the north and the south on a globe. But we don't have that. And this is just one example. Actually, we have tons of examples. But here's a depiction, of course, of the magnetic flux reading over a plane. And it matches perfectly with feral cell images. This is exactly what we would expect to see. We would expect that the magnetic field gets weaker towards the south until you get all the way back to where it wraps around. So the data matches a flat Earth but not a globe earth. We also have radio transmissions using horizontal line of sight. So oftentimes globers say that's something about bouncing off the ionosphere, but they get confused. There is sky wave propagation, which is the claim right here of the globe that it bounces up and down. And then you have ground wave propagation. This cannot bounce off the ionosphere. And I showed last time on the military document that they have a 10 foot tall tower that shoots 500 mile long transmissions that can be picked up. That's physically impossible on a globe. And you have to claim that it just bends around the globe. And again, not even agreed upon explanation and Theory, how that could possibly happen. So in, in summary, uh, hopefully we get to the actual specifics of the argument and we avoid sophistry, which is the use of fallacious arguments with the intention to deceive. For example, if I straw man flat earth and everything I think 
it should be the case on a flat earth, then therefore it's stupid and I'm correct. So yeah, uh, basically we have empirical evidence that establishes the default position. We can go through all the specifics and we One need minute. to establish that the claim that everything is the opposite of what we observe is actually true. And hopefully we get to that without drowning in fallacies. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Austin. We really appreciate it. And now we will kick it over to Tony for his opening statement. Tony, at your first word, I will restart your timer. The floor is all yours. Um, yeah, just a moment. I need to um, set up my... Sorry, I just need to upload a few things. No worries. Just want to let everybody know while he's looking that up that uh, we will be only be able to reading... We will only be able to read the ten dollar and up super chats tonight because we'd have to get out of here early. Um, Austin has uh, prior engagement, so we have to get out of here by nine o'clock sharp. So if you have a super chat uh, that's ten dollars and up, that will definitely be read. Otherwise, I can't guarantee anything. Um, and I was going to uh, say yeah. that we have. Uh, you ready? Okay. No, I'm not because I need to convert it into. I need to convert the presentation into PDF for you. So just uh, because you don't support my file uh, size. It can, you can just share the screen on StreamYard here. Okay, can I? Yeah, just go down to the, the bottom in the middle where it says present. Click that yep. and it says share screen. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do here is, um, can you see that presentation? Not yet. Okay, let me see. Okay. Yep. Can you see okay, this there it is. It's coming in. Okay, so this is the distance formula for a spherical uh, for a spheroidal earth. Every distance between two points measured on the surface of the earth can be well approximated using this formula provided we know their latitude and longitude. We can test this formula. For instance, we can test the length of the railway track between Takula and Kalgoorlie, the straightest and flattest um, piece of uh, railway line in the world. The track separation is 1,280 kilometers. The spherical estimate of the distance is 1,250 kilometers. This formula will always work for any two points on Earth's surface. And if, a flat, if the flat earthers want us to take their claim seriously, they need to find us two points where it doesn't. Here, for instance, we can look at the submarine cable joining Sydney and Hillsborough, Oregon. Cable length 13,528 kilometres, spherical distance 12,320 kilometres. We can test the um, spherical distance formula using the propagation of tsunamis. This in and of itself kills the flat earth, and I'm surprised that Wits blundered into it. We can see here the tsunami travel times compared against observations of uh, sea level rise at tide gauges. We can compare the um, travel times for um, earthquakes against the spherical distance formula, and they always work. You will notice that the first arrival times for all of these waves curve down which is to say that the further you get away from the source, the faster the, um, the, faster the, uh, uh, the wave seems to be traveling. Um, I've highlighted the P waves and the S waves there. There are two reasons for that. Um, one is that um, on, because the Earth is spheroidal, it's actually traveling a smaller distance than it would be on an equivalent flat Earth. Secondly, it's traveling at greater depth where there is higher velocity. Therefore, these downward curving seismic velocity um, profiles are, um, are proof that the Earth cannot be flat. In the second case, we can go to PKIKP waves, which are waves that travel directly through the Earth from one side to the other. You can see these waves highlighted here in the purple. Um, uh, and they make, multiple they make multiple tracks through this. They rebound. Here, for instance, we see the stacks for global seism um, uh, seismometers, and you can see highlighted in red are the clearly detectable waveforms for the, P for the various PKIKP um, reflections. We have flat Earth seismic models, and we use them quite a lot in mineral exploration. We send down seismic waves. They reflect off various um, surfaces, 
and they are detected by geophones. And we use these accurately and reliably to determine where mineral deposits might be underground, which leads to the question, at what distance, um, over what distance scale, are flat Earth seismic models um, accurate? And indeed, this has been something that has been looked at by seismologists. Here you can see two papers, the effect of ignoring Earth curvature and locating earthquakes. At what distance can the Earth no longer be treated as flat? We've looked at this question. Flat Earth seismic models do not work on distance scales greater than 150 kilometers. There's also a class of um, seismic wave, uh, the rally waves, that travel around the Earth from the focus to the antipode and back again. And the same behavior is observed by pressure waves. Here, for instance, is the pressure wave after six hours from, Tong from the Tonga eruption. And here it is four well, three days later. Um, these waves start out from the focus, they go around the other side of the Earth, and then they come back and they repeat this over multiple circuits. We saw this for the Tonga eruption. We saw it also for the Krakatoa eruption. We can um, determine that uh, the Earth is not flat because sunlight makes it onto the bottom of clouds. Um, you know, there is no way for the light path to get to the bottom of the clouds unless you're invoking refraction in the wrong direction. Refraction should occur to the more dense medium, not the less dense medium. And moving the sun further away doesn't make it any easier to get your light to the bottom of the cloud. The side of the cloud will intercept the light beams first. Whereas on a spherical Earth, this is very easy to explain. Now, Witsit made a very dishonest claim in saying that the sky matches the, um, the uh, spherical Earth um, is one of our arguments. No. It's not that the sky is compatible with a spherical Earth. It is that it is incompatible with a flat Earth. If you go, you know, if we double the distance from the North Pole, we expect double the angle. But the elevation of, say, Polaris or any other celestial object as you move away from its um, ground point does not match. The object cannot have a finite height at that distance. You know, the, the lines here do not um, intercept. Uh, similarly, you know, the idea that these photographs have been faked in 1965, I'd like to know what computers that was done on, because in 1965, we didn't have that capacity. We can also go to reciprocal zenith angles. If the Earth were flat, reciprocal zenith angles would add up to exactly 180 degrees, but they don't. Whenever we do these observations carefully, they add up to more than 180 degrees. This is incompatible with a flat Earth, and here are a bunch of um, publications on the subject where you will note that refraction effects are calculated and removed. Um, on a, uh, a triangle on the surface of a sphere, um, the angles always add up to more than 180 degrees. And in fact, the area of, the, of a spherical triangle is implicit on the, is um, exactly equal to R squared times the spherical excess. So we can, we can and have tested the spherical excess accuracy by comparing it to the area of the triangles that it surrounds. Um, the, if the Earth were planar, then the triangle should always add up to 180 degrees. That doesn't happen. Here again are a number of, um, uh, number of uh, uh, references on this point. Um, and finally, and most damningly, GPS simply tells us where stuff is in space um, using various analytical techniques, and we can tell that the Earth is spheroidal. Um, GPS is utterly inconsistent with a flat Earth, um, and, the, um, and the, any claim otherwise is um, delusional nonsense. That's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Tony. Really appreciate it. And now we will go ahead and kick it into the open discussion section in just a moment. But first, I just want to let you know, especially if it's your first time here joining us at Modern Day Debate, that we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics, and we want you to feel welcome no matter what walk of life you're from. If you have a question or a comment for one of tonight's debaters, fire it into the live chat and tag me at Modern Day Debate. Super chats will go to the top of the list. Tonight, we are only reading $10 and up super chats to uh, save time for the end because we have uh, one of the guests has to leave early. All we ask that you keep it civil, attack the argument and not the person. Insults will not be read. And that goes for the general discourse actually, in the live chat as well. Actually, do I still have two and a half minutes left? Because I have another presentation that I'd like to show in that case. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, go ahead. It's your time. Sorry. Um, uh, 
Okay, so um, here, for instance, are the rally waves that I mentioned. Oh, sorry, can you see? Sorry, what do you see? Um, you're seeing that one. Uh, the epicenter and the antipode. Yep, the, an the epicenter and the antipode. I can't find it on my screen, so I'm wondering what's going on. Um, Oh, there it is. Okay. So here we go. So if we have, we're going to assume that an earthquake occurs at the top of the sphere at the North Pole. Um, if the Earth were spheroidal, what we would expect is that the seismic energy would spread away from the um, epicenter. It would get to about the um, equator relative to the um, uh, relative to the source, and then it would start converging on the antipode. Um, that's what we would expect. And indeed, that is what we observe. One minute. Do you have anything else for the opening? Yes, I do. Um, so 45 seconds left. Okay. Here we go. So. Here is some data from the Macquarie Rise earthquake. Can you see this? No, not yet. You have to reshare the screen. Okay, stop that. Yep, okay, there you go. I'll reset it to one minute. I'll give you one All minute. All right. All right, so here's observational data of seismic arrival times for the Macquarie Rise, for the Macquarie Rise earthquakes. You can see the um, epicenter is the star there. You can see the blue circles are expanding out in a circle from the um, from the epicenter. If you now turn your attention to the right, you will see that the blue circles start converging on the antipode. You will get to a point at about this stage where you stop getting signals. This is because the seismic waves have to pass through the core where their velocities are much slower, and now you get them. So what we observe in earthquakes is exactly consistent with what we expect from a seismic model and is utterly inconsistent with a, flat, with a planar Earth. It simply cannot be explained. And I look forward to Witsit letting the word reflection run through his mouth as though I haven't anticipated it. But thank you. That's my time. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. And I... Uh... Where was I? Uh, I was saying that if you have a question for the debaters, uh, $10 Super Chats and up tonight only. Um, our guests are linked in the description below, whether you're listening on YouTube or via the podcast. So if you like what you're hearing tonight, please go feel free to click their links. Do it as soon as you can. Hit the subscribe button because we have plenty more debates coming your way that you don't want to miss, including on... Oh, I don't have the date on there. Um, the 27th, I believe, at 8 p.m. Uh, we'll have Stuart Connectly versus... Uh, I mean, Nadir, Nadir Ahmed, uh, they're going to be debating, uh, is Christianity true? And that's going to be coming up soon. So you don't want to miss that. Hit the subscribe button. And finally, just want to let you guys know about the debate com, the debate con, sorry, coming out on S Saturday, April 22nd in Fort Worth, Texas. The link is in the description below. If you want to get your tickets to come in person, please get on that as soon as you can. Thank you so much. And with that, we will go ahead and kick it to the open discussion. So, gentlemen, I'm going to put 60 minutes on the clock and that your first word have at it. Thank you so much. Okay. What's up, man? Um. Well, uh, apart from... So, you asked a number of questions. Um, it seems only fair to answer them. Why do tsunamis bounce off Antarctica and not reflect around? And that would be because Antarctica is atypical of all the continents in the world in having a very deep continental shelf. Um, uh, at, a, at around about a depth of 500 to 800 metres. So the propagation of tsunamis as they interact with that shelf is very different from the, other, from the other continents. And the reason the continental shelf around Antarctica is so deep is because of the load of the ice sheet that's on top of it. The mass of that ice sheet depresses, um, uh, depresses the continent of Antarctica um, and makes the shape of, makes the shape of the... Um, uh, uh, makes the shape of the uh, continental shelf atypical. In fact, I happened to work uh, across the corridor from one of the world experts in tsunami, prop tsunami propagation, and um, uh, he had no idea what flood earthers were even talking about using um, uh, tsunami data. 
Um, in fact, uh, if you neglect to include Coriolis effects in um, tsunami propagation, you get demonstrably wrong answers. You can't match the observations. And um, all right, all right, all right. let's just take it one at a time. That doesn't answer the question. If the if the radius of the waves is going all the way out to Antarctica, then there should be waves that wrap around it. So no, no. Really? So there aren't. So the the radius of the waves isn't greater than Antarctica. Um, it will eventually get greater than um, greater than Antarctica. Yeah, but that depends on how close you are to Antarctica, um, what the ray angle is. Um, so so and the amount of and the amount of, and the amount of diffraction. I noticed that I noticed that the um, particular tsunami. You're, you're claiming your claim is that the propagation of tsunamis is um, uh, is inconsistent with a um, with a sphere Earth geometry. Um, I've talked to um, tsunami experts, and they Tell say no, it isn't. Appeal to authority. Um, I, I covered the fallacies. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Well, you left out one of the fallacies, which was delusion. So if we don't, <laughs> if we don't have authority. So if you if you were at a party and you walked up to somebody who said, "I happen to be the greatest MMA fighter in the world," and you said, "Oh, can I watch any of your fights?" and they go, "Oh, they don't let me compete because there's a conspiracy against me." Well, those guys seem pretty good. Well, that's all <sighs> actor and CGI. And I also happen to be the world's best sprinter, the world's best fighter pilot, and um, the world's uh, the world's best chess player. They just don't let me compete because you know they've got these weird things about qualifications and and you know um, and, and it's all and it's all a conspiracy against me. You're claiming you are claiming personally to be the world's greatest cartographer, the world's greatest tsunami expert, the world's greatest seismologist, the world's greatest geodesist, the world's greatest geophysicist the world's greatest seismologist, the world's greatest astronomer, and the world's greatest astrometer. If anybody came up to you at a party and claimed to be the greatest thing and, and also to have revolutionized our understanding of general and special relativity and to have overturned optics, you've claimed all of these things and you have no qualifications. You have achieved nothing. You can yeah. demonstrate nothing um, in regard to any of these fields, you've hey, got no publications. You've got no work. I'll be finished shortly. I think we should um, let uh, uh, okay. Winston have the full photo of it. Let's go ahead. All right, all right. I just I got to do this. Okay. So you just brought up that I don't have credentials, thus I must be wrong. I literally no. that's called a that's called a credentials fallacy. It, it, no, if, I, it's I, okay I to it, you calm down. Okay. You didn't straw man me and claimed I claim to be the greatest, all these different things. Never in my life have I ever done that. Also, I agree that when people like dedicate their life to study a field, they obviously have expertise in that field and their, their opinions value uh, valued, but that doesn't mean they're automatically right. So like your argument isn't correct because someone with the authority position you appeal to says it, that's what the fallacy is. And you also went a long way around not answering the basic question, which was, the, the waves are going to be wider than Antarctica's claim to be on the globe, which means the waves that don't hit Antarctica's continental shelf would wrap around Antarctica, but that's never observed. They actually come back. They reflect back, which makes sense this on four, maybe a, a four flatter. Reason by, four reasons I already explained. No. Okay. You know, the, yes, I did. I gave you the data and you know your, your claim that just because I talked to my mate that's not the issue. The issue is that there is an extensive scientific literature out there um, that explicitly explores all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, models and the details of them, how they work, and whether or not they are consistent with the observations. You haven't appealed to a single one of those. You haven't used a single um, scientific. You're just saying, "Well, it doesn't make sense to me." Well, okay. No, you're not answering. It doesn't the make sense to you. So what? Who cares? Right, let's make sure Nobody we're on the same. It makes sense to you. Let's make sure we're on the same page. So say that the wave's not really big and it hits the continent, then what'll happen is it'll start to spread out and get, I get that, okay? And you're saying that the continental shift is different, uh, our shelf is different in, in, in Antarctica because it's deeper, so it doesn't allow it to wrap around. That's what you're claiming. That's irrelevant. If by the time the wave reaches Antarctica, it's wider than Antarctica, then the parts that reach it are going to wrap around the continent. No, because the because the um, the mechanical propagation of tsunamis is depth controlled, right? It, the the tsunami itself 
is not um, a uniform a uniform pressure wave from the bottom of the ocean to the surface of the ocean. Most of the Strong. mechanical forcing, most of the mechanical. You can say straw man all you like. You're just reinforcing that you don't know what you're talking about. If the the wave can only diffract if it has a physical thing to diffract with, right? If the um, if the wave is up here near the surface and the shelf is down here, there will be no interaction between the wave and the shelf. Therefore, the depth of the shelf, and I understand that you don't understand what you're talking about, that's fine, okay? And it's brave of you to admit it. Um, but now you're telling, you, 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 and you and you just lied. You lied a few minutes ago. What you're so, you said, you said that you are not claiming to be the greatest tsunami expert on the planet. But nope. now you're saying that all of the scientific literature on tsunamis and on tsunami modeling um, is wrong and that your, um, uh, and that your um, particular understanding of what should happen for these near, for these near Antarctic um, tsunamis is correct. And they're all wrong. That's I'm what saying, you're, you're not even answering the question. So we can move on. We'll let the audience decide. You didn't answer the question. It's just objective. But I bet most people in the audience didn't know that there's one place that's an anomaly on the earth that all of a sudden tsunamis can't wrap around them, even though, of course, tsunamis wrapping around land, right. land and masses it turns out is a well known phenomenon. It's a really deep continental shelf that has a massive great ice sheet on it. Yeah. Okay. Well done, mate. Okay, but the radi the waves, the radius of the waves would be greater than the alleged circumference of uh, Antarctica, so it would still wrap around it. No, you can just keep saying, nah, uh, well, we can get more into it. I mean, if it gets to interact with the continental shelf, which it doesn't because the continental shelf is too deep. So it just you know, goes through it? If you don't understand the physics of it, I'm not going to, you know. Well, does I it reflect off of it? Yes, it will. I thought it didn't interact with it. No, it'll inter it doesn't interact with the shelf. It inter interacts with the continent itself. So it bypasses the shelf, hits the mm -hmm. um, edge of the continent, hits the shoreline, and then reflects off that. So all tsunamis reflect back from Antarctica, and none of them ever wrap around it. Is that correct? Um, I wouldn't say that. That would depend on the origin of the uh, the origin of the um, tsunami and the magnitude of it. None um, of them ever wrap around Antarctica ever. Um. Uh, you can claim that. Uh, oh, you're claiming your that one does. Where's your source? It? Where's your source? Uh, all tsunami. I, so. I showed a. I showed a. I showed a picture of tsunami propagation, and I showed so publications. I. And I showed paid, showed publications of um, uh, uh, of the. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you don't know. just so really just so I'm clear. Who is saying that the uh the the tsunamis wrap around Antarctica? He's saying he's saying that he's saying he doesn't know if they do or not. He thinks that they do. So I'm like, okay, well, I've never seen it. You got some evidence of that. I mean, I'm pretty sure they don't. Like, it's they like a, thing. Up a, a a screen right now, Tony. Yeah, sure. Just a second. Because there we can get to. I mean, there's all kinds of problems with what you're claiming about earthquakes, such as. Okay, so we have all we have non-uniform wave velocity, anisotropy of the actual waves themselves. Yeah. We have anomalous attenuation rates. We have shadow zones. You claim that the the primary and secondary waves always disperse relative to the core and what they can penetrate, and they always do it, quote unquote. Objectively, they do not. I can drop all kinds of sources from Harvard and Stanford if that's what you would like. Let's see. Uh, uh, deformation of earth materials, introduction into the rheology of solid earth, Cambridge University Press, temperature, iron content, and seismic velocity in the D layer, actually explaining that the anomalous D layer doesn't match the model's predictions at all. We ha I have literally 10 citations right here saying that it doesn't always work, doesn't match the predictions. We have all kinds of issues with the core, with the mantle, with the in-between area called the D layer, where we have anomalous velocities of seismic activity that don't match the model whatsoever. Do you know what the D double D double prime layer is? Can you explain? It's the area between the core and the mantle. Okay, it's the area just above the core mantle boundary. Um, and why is it anomalous? Well, because we have varying anomalous velocities, right? And actual what dispersion. What does, an, what does an anomalous? Why are you asking me mean? questions? You claim that it worked perfect. I'm proving to the audience you made you, that up. It doesn't work perfect. Okay. It's, well, yes, a model doesn't have to work perfectly to be right. Okay. And why do you claim it does? All models are wrong. Some models are useful as opposed to the flat earth model, which is useless. 
Okay, there is absolutely no <laughs> practical application for which the for which the flat Earth model is useful. Providing, all all technology ever, but whatever. Um, bullshit. Yeah. You're making that up. Horizontal radio absolutely. propagation, radar technologies, no, the way that we fly planes, no, the way no, that you're, we. You're just lying. You are just barefaced lying, and you know you're lying. You just got ad homes, man. At, look at the smile on your face. You know you are bullshitting. It's because you, you're using you a lot of fallacies. You can't, you can't produce. Perhaps we can. You can't produce a single reference in support. All yes, we I can. have is you say, what the D double prime layer um, has a different viscosity. You know that's how we know it's there. Because it, um, because of the effect it had on the transition of um, waves through it, and we know, about it? Anisotro- we know about anisotropy um, in the mantle. In fact, the paper I referenced was just exploring anisotropy in the innermost yeah. inner core. You say mm. this as though it's something that um, something that scientists are unaware of. No, I didn't say that. We're aware no, of I'm it, st- and we're refining our understanding okay. and building a more full understanding. The fact that we discover stuff that we didn't know about before is not an excuse for rejecting the entire spheroidal model. Okay, flat this is all models, fluff. Flat Earth models don't work. Flat Earth seismic models don't work. I showed yeah. you the references. I, I showed respond? you the references. Um, if right. you want. Let's let, let, let's let, can you respond, please? Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm not saying that because there's some anomalies, all of it's wrong. I, I never said that they were unaware of it. These are all straw mans. So what I'm actually doing is addressing your claim in your opener that it works perfect. It does it, and it's not even close. And I'm just going to list some of the problems. So we have the existence of the ultra slow and super rigid zones. So the current model predicts that the speed of seismic waves should be relatively constant in the Earth's mantle, but observations have revealed that regions where seismic waves travel much slower or faster than expected are co- frequently occurring. We have the African and Pacific that LL. Paper conclude that therefore the Earth is flat. Can you just that, tell that's me? A, that's a straw man. No, so, no, it isn't a straw man. You're citing this paper. What was its conclusion about the geometry of the Earth? All or nothing fallacy. Um, you know what that is? Um, yes, I do know what that is. Define you it. Can't just, you can't just cherry pick bits out of a paper that Define you barely it. understand, that you Define have it. no expertise to um, to understand, and then say, the fallacy, well, bro. therefore, that justifies me in the conclusion that the earth is flat. The topic under debate is whether or not the earth is flat. If you're introducing these publications, these publications must support your position that the earth is flat and they don't. Okay. That's incorrect. That's called an all or nothing fallacy. So I don't have to believe Can you please show, I don't have to believe everything that a source says to invoke them. In fact, this is a hostile witness and this is actually a rebuttal to your opening presentations. Positive claim. Models were perfect. It's a rebuttal. It's a, it's a straw man. Tony, let's let's let him finish his uh, sentence. Tony, 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 I didn't say. I know, I know, but just let him finish the sentence and you can, Refute it. Go ahead. You invoked this as evidence the Earth's a globe, and actually you claim exclusivity, that it would only work on a globe, and we know so because of the verifiability of it. But actually, that is not true. I'm only res- I didn't say these people think the Earth's flat. I didn't invoke this as evidence of flat Earth. I'm, I'm rebutting your inaccurate claim to the audience that it matches the globe perfectly or that it's close to perfect and that it can only work on a globe. No, I only I got through one that. thing on the list, and you freaked out. I didn't say, but you're you're attributing to me. Okay, I know all of the stuff that you're about to say, right? There are <laughs> low viscosity zones. There are high viscosity zones. Yeah, yeah, mate. I studied seismology for my PhD, right? You're not telling me anything new here, right? And you're, but you are presenting you are presenting things that aren't generally known to the aren't known to the general public, but seismologists all know. And there are no flat Earth seismologists. We can prove using seismology the geometry of the Earth. And I know a flatter seismologist. So what does that um, mean? What does that have to do with anything? Uh, introducing, um, show me his publications. I'm not saying his name. He has a YouTube channel, though. Show, show me his publications. What, okay. what are his publications? Where doesn't does he know. work? Okay, it doesn't know. A, CK, a, guy well, on YouTube, a guy on YouTube is not a seismologist. He is a seismologist, but the problem is if I was to say his name, you would probably go harass where he works or something. So I just want to point no, out, I though. Want to know, I want to see his publication. Where is his okay, publication? Well, I'll try, where I'll try is his to, publication I'll, I'll, establishing that the earth is flat? I'll, okay, straw man. So I'll see if no, he's no, open. it's not a straw man. Asking for references is not a straw man. I mean, that or matter Glover, that's not like emotionally impulsive. So here. perhaps we could dig in deeper into this low viscosity zone evidence. If you guys wanted to talk about that specifically, sure. that might be more interesting. 
Yeah, like I just I think this will be cool. Like, let me just list off some of the freaking um, anomalies or discrepancies, and then you can teach me. You probably know more about it than me, but you you were a bit misleading saying that it worked really well. It doesn't. We have all kinds of problems. It so, works every- really well, mate. You know that is bullshit. The these these anomalies that you're talking about, they are um, velocity anomalies of less than a percent. They are detectable, but the the velocity variations are really tiny. You know, to say and to say that a one percent in a one, you know, these these are fractions of a percent in velocity, and you're putting them up like, well, the model doesn't work at all. No, one of the reasons we can reject the flat Earth geometry is that you can't do flat Earth inversions on where on um, uh, uh, on velocity. You can't do tomographic. Um, uh, you can't do flat earth tomography and get consistent velocity results. They don't produce consistent results. And you get massive tomographic anomalies, you know, multiple percents. Um, So the stuff that you're saying is imperfections in our model, it's vastly worse if you use flat earth models. You're incorrect. You just claim that it's it's always less than 1%. That is not true either. So I don't know why you keep saying this kind of stuff. It seems like you're trying to be misleading, but I'm just going to read off the list, okay? And that's poisoning the world fallacy. Well, you are you are intentionally misrepresenting things. I don't. No, I'm not. Okay, you said you did a. In, well, it, is, it is a question of fact. Said, we could. What, pull I, the what I said I was in general. In yeah, general, yeah. These things are, these things just give small. me just give me just a second, and I'll let you go. Okay, man, you're you've talked most time. Can I just just a second. Okay, so we have the existence of ultra slow and super rigid zones. I explained that we have the African and Pacific LLSPPs, which is called lo- large low shear velocity provinces or regions in the Earth's lower mantle where seismic waves travel slower than in surrounding areas. The lack of equal distribution doesn't make sense in the current model. We have the anomalous D layer. We talked about that where we have all kinds of anomalous uh, discrepancies within seismic activity. It's not just velocity. It's all kinds of stuff. We have anomalous surface wave velocities as well. Right. And so I have all the different sources here if you want to look at them, but it's from Oxford Press, Geophysical Journal International. These are Springer International Publishing, uh, a Geophysical Journal International, Origin of the Pacific and African LOSVPs. I have all this data here at Cambridge University saying we have a tons of anomalies and it's way yeah. more than 1%. I don't know where you what got you, that idea. What do, you think, what do you think the term anomaly means in science? Okay, in this context, it means that the model has a certain prediction and that the data is anomalous to the prediction. It doesn't match. No, that's not yes. what it means. So yes, it does. A scientific anomaly is a deviation from a background average. So what we so when we talk about a velocity anomaly, we measure that velocity anomaly relative to the background average. Um, so saying that there's a velocity anomaly is just saying the velocity isn't uniform. Um, you know, sim- similarly, when we talk about temperature anomalies, we don't, um, you know, all we're saying is that the temperature has varied from the background value. That's what the scientific definition of anomaly is. And the same is true with gravity anomalies. We're not saying that seismic models cease to work. We're not saying that gravitational models cease to work. What we're saying is that there is a deviation from uniformity. And we don't expect uniformity. Because we can see, we can see from the surface of the Earth, Earth's properties are not uniform at the surf, surface, and we can see, you know, from the existence of mid-ocean ridges, subduction plates, um, et cetera, et cetera, we can see oh that it's God. not uniform at depth. Completely so, different. Isotropic, it's much more homogeneous and isotropic in the under layers of your own model as opposed to topographical obstruction. That's not the same at all. It's entirely different. If you understood what gravity in the geodynamo model was, you would know that it's much more isotropic and homogeneous of a predicted model. In addition, you claimed it was 1%. And I have a citation here that's saying that it's over 40%. So that seems a little yeah. different. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll drop you the citation. So, like, do you, do you agree that you maybe misspoke that it's not always always under one percent? It says this represents. Well, I would uh, if there, if there are anomalies, you... if there are anomalies that large, they must be um, extremely localized. Okay, so we have P waves, of course, for the audience, primary waves, and the lowermost mantle that's about four to five or four point five to five kilometers per second, while models predicted the speeds of about seven to eight kilometers a second. This represents a velocity discrepancy of about 30 to 40% compared to model predictions. I'd like to see that paper. Okay. So where did you get the less than 1% thing? 
Well, I looked up tomographic results for the upper for the upper mantle. Okay, I, and I mean, they yes, they right. agree to within less than one percent. So, you know, I didn't make that claim um, out of thin air, and I would like to know the um, the. Uh, that the other question that I have for you is what is the geographical scale of this? But you aren't giving me the paper. I will drop the paper for you in here. But like the point is that you missed, well, you, you're, 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 you're insisting on debating something and then not giving me access to the paper. I just said I have like 10 papers here that support everything I'm saying. I just said I'll drop it. You may no, drop they them don't. The None of them support anything that you're saying. What you're they saying, do. You know, I, unless, unless what you're saying is there are minor variations in the spheroidal model. Forty percent. Then, then yes, that was well. That depends on the that depends on the geographical scale that I can't comment on because I don't have the fucking paper because you can't put it in the chat apparently. Um, because oh, that's yeah, I can. I'll drop them all in the chat, but I, I just want I want to make sure I'm giving. I only specific... want the one with the forty percent. Don't drop okay. them all. I'll be okay. here all day trying to read them. I want. Okay, there you paper. go. It's in the private chat, bud. There you go. Even cited for you. Okay, so let's just kind of recap here, right? So, like the in reality, the the mechanism for these waves isn't even agreed upon. They don't even know what the mechanism is. I I'm, I want to make sure I don't misspeak. So I have like the notes I took here, right? There are all kinds of different proposed mechanisms that aren't even. You have the acoustic mechanism, the convection mechanism, the standing accretion shock instability theory to propose the mechanism. They don't even agree how it works. Now the globe, the anti-flat earth proponents, what they do is they bring this up to say, we know exactly how the waves work, the primary and secondary wave, the P and S waves in the earth. We know exactly how they distribute. We know what exactly the layers are. And we know that it goes through the globe and we can predict it every time. In reality, that does not happen. What they classify as primary waves go where they're not supposed to go. And the same goes with secondary waves. So the waves that aren't supposed to penetrate the alleged core do penetrate it. We have all kinds of discrepancies with the velocities up to 40% in certain areas, right? We have all kinds of discrepancies. They don't even know the mechanism. And then there's an entire layer between the core and the mantle where there's everything is off. It's completely chaotic and unpredictable. So, the, and then that's why I pointed out, in fact, earthquakes causing tsunamis don't help you because the tsunamis never wrap around Antarctica. It makes more sense on our, in our situation where they would bounce off of Antarctica. So you've created where's some your, narrative where, where it makes sense in the result? globe. But... You say this, you say this, you assert this, and you've got absolutely no observational evidence supporting it. I showed what? tsunami travel times compared with um, compared with sea level records. I did it in my presentation. We take observations. You're just making assertions. You 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 don't use observations. This um, Garnero et al. paper. Um, uh, reckons that seven percent is the size of the P wave um, is the size of the P wave anomaly. Um, the Wrong. Um, it does read the abstract. Oh, so you didn't even go to the citation? You read the see. This is the yeah, problem. Mate, in two minutes. In two minutes, I can't read an entire scientific paper. But I cited it, page one forty nine through one fifty eight. I'm pretty sure it says it right there. I don't know why you're yeah, like that's the entire paper, mate. Okay. Well, it says right here that it predicts 4.5 to 5 kilometers a second compared to the prediction of 7 point, or it predicts 7 to 8, and it was measured 4.5. So that's more well, than 7%. Um, uh, measured. How did they measure it? A, seism, a seismometer. Uh, a seismometer. Okay. Cannot measure velocities at the core mantle boundary. Oh, what Can did they use to measure it? So what they do is they calculate the velocity using tomographic models, don't they? They don't observe it. They don't measure it. No, this is an important distinction. They do a calculation <laughs> from the things that they can observe, right? They wow, can we observe. got to the... Go ahead, sorry. Um, uh, well, you know, if you're not interested in having it explained to you, that's fine. No, it's hilarious. Um, you just admitted that it's just calculative assumptions based on models, which is a beg in the question fallacy. So if you want to move to the next subject, we did. No, about no, it isn't because we can exclude flat earth models. We oh, have yeah. tried, we have assumed the earth is flat. We've tried to model it, assuming that it's flat and it flat out doesn't work. We tried to model it, it assuming a globe. Work. It doesn't work. Yes, it does work. There I just told you why it doesn't work. There are um, no, you didn't. You cited a bunch of scientists who don't agree with you, and this this is where we get back 
to the delusion aspect. Such a fallacy. You think you think that you are capable of analyzing and properly interpreting these papers, and you aren't. You cherry pick bits and pieces out of them, and then you present them as though you fully understand and as though the authors would agree with your conclusions, how you have interpreted the data. But you have no qualifications that would permit this. Instead, you have delusional self-confidence that you can read stuff that is meant for actual specialists. All fallacies. Um, uh, no, all true. Ad hoc right? fallacy. If, if, you, if you turn up, if you turn up at a, if you turn up at an airport and tell them that you've read the manuals and you should be allowed to fly a plane, what do you think they're going to do? Are they going clear. to let you fly a plane? Uh, if you turn up at a hospital and tell them that you're the world's greatest brain surgeon and they should let you operate, do you think they're going to let you do it? No, they're going to want to see your qualifications. You okay. don't have any. If you don't have any, build the credentials. If they, if, they, if, they, if, they, if they don't, if you, if they if if you don't have any qualifications, then let's see your achievements. Let's hey. see what it is that you have done, have contributed yeah. to human understanding and human um, technological development, or That's any subjective, or any flat earther. Okay. First of all, uh, that's completely irrelevant, and there are all kinds of flat earthers that done a lot of uh, did a lot of things, and a lot of the people that think there's a globe, they assume a stationary, they assume a stationary topographical plane to do most of their technology anyway. So it doesn't really that's matter what you're what you're saying. Is, this yeah. is all, my man, chill. You just monologued. This is all sophistry. Everything you said was a fallacy. We've already spent 30 minutes on it. The truth of the matter is, is I just named off just a fraction of all the problems with it I have written down. You misrepresented the truth in your presentation and acted like the model works perfect and debunks flat earth, but that is not true. I didn't say the model works perfect at any point and you keep on repeating- Works every quote. time. That's what you said. What I, would, what I said was that works every the time. model represents reality well. The you said model works every time. Accurate. The model is accurate every time. Okay, let's go back to um let's, let's bring up the PIK we can test it. We P I K I P waves. Stop you brought those up. Okay, oh, right. I'm sorry, I can't understand what you guys are saying right now. Um I'm just saying, okay. like, I want specific instead of like these like big like oh you don't do anything all the like let's get into the specifics right like stop using all kinds of fallacies they don't make you pass logic for a PhD I guess but it's just a bunch of fallacies and you personally attacking me just it's, wasting time I don't have a lot of time tonight so um, you want to well, get into specifics time, so you know let's let's get more atoms so we have we P I K I P actually, right actually we can actually. We can actually show up. Here are an infinite number of um, uh, of. Are you sharing the screen again, Tony? I really will try and share the screen. Okay, so PIKIP wave amplitudes do not match the predictions. The atmospheric conditions mess them up. You have the wave frequencies not being consistent, and you have the um, the wave polarization being inconsistent with the model predictions. So even the PIKIP waves you brought up don't work. The P and the S waves they aren't like some amazing the mere model that always work. of PKIKP waves proves that the earth isn't flat a no, wave that goes you... through the earth from the source to the other side cannot be on a flat earth can it first of all you're assuming it's going down vertically through an assumed spherical model and assuming the density layers and the elemental composition of those layers and you're using a um, horizontal elemental, sedimentary layer elemental, model that's been debunked the elemental composition has nothing to do with it mate you're using a, your density layers you're using a sedimentary horizontal layer model which wait, has wait, been debunked it's been debunked can your you sedimentary model layer has been debunked can you see this presentation do you yes, need to assume Tony, sedimentary okay. layers for it so um, this is there's nothing about sedimentation in this. Well, you don't you don't use horizontal sedimentary layers inside of your model. Um, we use um, uh, you don't know what sedimentary layers means. What you mean to say is this a radially symmetric model that's being developed? No. Yes, it is. No um, seismology yeah, that, that's with exactly geology. What you mean. You, 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 um, you no seismology has nothing to do with geology. Really? Um, so the layers well, of the earth has nothing to do with it? Um, yeah. In 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 reality, yes. The okay, but there's something called the great unconformity. Uh, before we, before seismology. we move to the next point, uh, let's hear what he has to say with this. Uh, so okay. we can get off the screen. This what, what is an here? infinite right. number of predictions. Okay, these curves right here. With these curves represent predictions 
of when particular phases from particular earthquakes are going to be detected by um, seismometers at a particular angular distance from the focus. And we can see, um, so whenever there's an earthquake, you could disprove this. You could disprove this model. You could simply point out that this model is incredibly wrong, is just absolutely inadequate and doesn't even get close to reality. Um, you could do that by just looking at observations. You could find one, one um, uh, earthquake where the pattern of first arrivals is um, utterly incompatible with this. And let's return to this stack. You can see here's the first 10 minutes down the bottom, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. You can see that the waves have traveled as far as they can go, 100, you know, 180 kilometers within 20 minutes. But the waves keep bouncing around back and forth for you know hours. Um, so um, and they sample the various um, the, you know they sample the various um, uh, forms of the world. And you haven't even addressed Rayleigh waves. Rayleigh waves, as I pointed out previously, travel from the epicenter to the antipode and back again through mul multiple cycles. This is not possible on a flat Earth. Explain to me how it is. Uh, where where do they go to and come back from? They start from the epicenter, and they epicenter radiate of what? the earthquake. Okay, and then they radiate, and then they come back from where? They radiate out to the antipode. Oh, you know, maybe it's better if I just show you. So a, they uh, do a full symmetrical uh, loop around the globe, yes. and then they hit each they other come and bounce back, back, and then they come back. Wow, it's almost back. like there's something that reflects them, and they don't just uh -huh. wrap around. Fantastic. I was hoping you'd say that. In fact, I you've warned been, you dude, during my dude, presentation that, I don't that, care. that wouldn't be the dude, case. You've made 10 different false claims already. Like, it's been... And yeah, it's you're like, delusional, like, mate. If you weren't delusional, chat, I'd care what you were saying. I just just for the chat to know, right? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten cited sources in here that explain exactly what I was saying earlier. Right. So right, it's, okay. it's a it's a fact that the entire cons uh, seismic model is completely anomalous and flooded with. Then why do we get paid? Then why do we get paid to do, um, to do underground surveys? for People minerals? think the Earth's a ball. They want to explain earthquakes. They assume the Earth's a ball, dude. And this is what right, I want. Can we move to no another one of the subjects? We should assume the Earth is flat and hey. we can show that the flat Earth models don't work. Okay. We okay. can make your assumption. We can take your, you know, I my PhD was actually in flat earth seismic models because the mathematics is easier, right? We know how to do this and we get accurate results over short distances. But when you try and do it over long distances, it doesn't work. It Even on the globe. Working. Pardon? Even on the globe. So basically what you just admitted yes, was- Yes, they do one... work on the globe. Can I, they can don't I work perfectly because we don't have perfect information about what's in the interior okay. of the globe. So we are learning. Okay. So that's why I was, that's why let, I to have a point. response real quick. Yeah, I just want to point like it's been it's been whatever half the debate and like this was your point and I gladly just talk to you about the thing that you know more about. But I want to point out that you did admit to everyone that well you don't actually directly observe them or measure them with any type of equipment. It's a calculative model assumption. You then said that we know with extreme accuracy using a flat model what it goes out to 150 kilometers, but then outside of that it doesn't work. But it doesn't work outside of that even on the globe model. I just listed all kinds of anomalies. I dropped no, all of my you, sources. So you, if we can you, move on to another you, subject, no, you, that would be cool. He's created a logical fallacy there, and I'm not willing to let onto it. Um, an imperfection. What is the fallacy? In, the fallacy is saying that so, saying that spheroidal seismic models are imperfect means that they are equally inac as inaccurate as flat Earth models. That is not the case. Flat Earth models are demonstrably, vastly, incredibly less accurate than spheroidal models. Can I, when and you use a flat Earth model. Over, Wibbling uh, over details. Can isn't I ask going you a question, please? I, I don't know yeah. the answer to this. When you use a flat Earth model, what what depth are you using in your model? Um, we can go down to um, arbitrary depths. We've got that was actually the point of my PhD was adapting. We can go down as far as you like. We've got numerically stable routines. Can I go down five million miles? If you want to, if you want to have five million miles of stuff in there, sure. Okay, so this is my point. You're claiming to have represented the flat Earth 
with your seismic data and you assume thousands of miles below our feet when the flat earth knows that you can't verify anything past 7.8 miles. And there's actually a dielectric plane that's within the inertial plane or the block domain wall of the magnetic field that is not materially accessible. And that's what all science and physics say. So you straw man flat earth. I covered that in my presentation though. No, you didn't. Look, look this is, this is gibbering nonsense. This, this, these sesquipedalian regurgitations of utter gibberish um, don't impress anybody because anybody with an ounce, you know, you, you you use this to sort of convince your flat earth flat earth buddies that you know what you're talking about when you when you just rabbit off a bunch of polysyllabic gibberish and and, it's, and 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 it's. Um, you, no, it's a description, mate. It's, Do you it's, want it's, to it's address my point about the depth assumption you apply um, to a straw man we, version we, of a flat we, earth? Well, the, the reality is that um, the reflections from depth attenuate very, very quickly if you just have, a, um, if you just have a, um, an arbitrarily deep. The sources that we're looking at, um, you know, the, the larger sources, if you apply them, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. It can't work. Um, you know, and I explained to you why the PNS waves, you, you, looked at the, you look at the arrival times of the PNS waves and how they seem to be getting deeper. On a flat earth, the, it, the wave, a P wave coming from, uh, coming from a source has to go down, go across, and go up. And that is extra, um, extra mileage on it. On a spheroidal earth where the surface is over that, it's taking a shortcut through. Right, and it's traveling at greater depth. So the fact that the PNS wave arrival times curve down is direct refutation of the flat Earth models. You cannot have the observed the observed material. You say that, but again, you're delusional. Okay, you, so you say you, you say just, stuff. You you're say just ignoring stuff. Ignoring my point. And okay, then, so and so well, what, your, what's uh, his evidence? Ask what's his evidence? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, for one, you're building all the all the interpretations of evidence, the seismic... observations, mate. Where are your <laughs> observations validating your position? Yeah. So we have the don't same. Don't argue with me. Don't 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 use your sophistry. Show <laughs> me your evidence. Show I mean, me the evidence. Me. Observations. You're Where are me your up, observations? Bro. Um, yeah, like so we can use the same data that you have, but the problem is that you're interpreting the data based upon all kinds of assumptions, like the different layers of then the earth, do the depth the same of the earth. analysis without the assumptions. Okay, but we can't well, the thing is we can't verify below 7.8 miles. So you're you're making a calculative model assumption based on all kinds of theoretical ideas of the layers, and it admittedly doesn't work, and they're constantly changing no, it. It's just no, that's work. bullshit. That's your bullshit. PhDs the, in the pseudoscience. It doesn't work. It is admittedly not completely accurate. That is a very that is very very different. That's no. like saying that radar isn't completely accurate. Therefore, radar is useless. Okay, no, the, we can no. we can just make up the distance to things um, because radar isn't one hundred percent. Nowhere accurate. close to as accurate as radar. Not um, even yes, close. it is. Forty percent. Forty percent. Um, it, assuming your claim is true through a body that is of the thickness 20 kilometers right so that so it would be in that um it would be in that for about 0.4 of a second well no 1.23 two two seconds right. so it would be about 0.8 of a second anomaly so there's it was a less than of 1%. A second anomaly anomaly on a tiny subfraction of the wave packets and you're claiming you're claiming on that basis that the entirety of seismology can be thrown out, even the bits no. that the oil companies and the mineral exploration companies rely on to get to make the computer that you're using. No, I just like to I like to argue with debate the people on in like their field of expertise, and I've demonstrated that this is just a glorified begging the question fallacy. You presuppose that the Earth is a sphere. You then make calculative no, assumptions. You we yourself said you don't make the Earth record. Donald. We've tried flat earth. I, how many times do I have to say it? We have tried flat earth. <laughs> we've used them. And then you say, you just assume it's a sphere. No, we've tried modeling it as flat and it doesn't work. Yeah, but you Get never rebut. You're, you know, you've got this cobweb of delusion around you. You can't even take in information. I've explained this to you 10 times already in this debate. No, you we ignore my rebuttal. Model, and we have used them. Okay, look, and you got to calm down, man. You, work. 
All right, you can't just scream and thus get to interrupt me. You need to chill, okay? Like, the point is that I rebutted. You said we use the flat earth, and I said, no, you made all kinds of, like, depth assumptions that flat earth doesn't actually make or believe at all. You took so the globe idea. You, you took the globe. Or... Listen, right, man. We, Johnny, let's, let him, let's let him finish. You oh, took please. the globe idea of the depths and how to interpret the waves and then try to put it on a localized horizontal region. And then you came on the internet and claimed you tested flat earth. So, you know, you had to know the depths. That's what all seismics built on. And we can't verify past 7.8 miles. We do not make fairy tale claims about what's beneath that. You taking density layers based on a globe model and throwing it on a horizontal region and then saying it doesn't work on flat earth is ridiculous. No, that's not what we do. We allow the velocity profiles to vary. That's what tomography is. So we start from a base model and then we allow the um, velocity profiles to vary in response to the observations. So we don't just make assumptions. And when we allow the flat earth models, the flat earth tomographic data to do that, it doesn't produce consistent results. You get different velocity profiles for the same region from different earthquakes and different seismometer um, combinations. The flat earth combinations can't work. That it happens on the globe. Work. No, it doesn't. I just this, cited this, this, it. This, you, no, you didn't. What you I cited, cited was, was what you, what you cited, I cited was minor imprecisions in our knowledge in our knowledge and understanding of the earth at great depth. That is not no. the same as saying that the model doesn't work at all. No, first um, of all, you, you, you're just saying it's minor, but it's up to 40%. We have the S wave shadow zone. Wait up, tiny. wait up, wait up, wait up, man. So we have the S wave shadow zone, waves that are completely blocked when they encounter the liquid outer core, resulting in a shadow zone, the opposite side of the Earth as well. But this shadow zone extends from about 103 to 142 degrees from the earthquake epicenter and is characterized by a lack of S wave arrivals. However, some S waves can be converted to P waves when they encounter the boundary between the Earth's mantle and core, allowing them to travel through the liquid outer core and reach the opposite side of the Earth as a P wave. So whenever their model doesn't work and it goes through where it's not supposed to, they say, oh, well, we can convert it. And vice versa, you have P wave shadow zone issues. You have P wave reflection. You have P wave diffraction. You have S wave scattering. You have discrepancies in P wave velocity anomalies, magn magnitude discrepancies. So we've spent most of the debate on this. Can I bring up one of my points now, dude? Because you, because we buried. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> when, so you, you don't get to spout a lot of bullshit about the discipline that I'm an, um, I'm an expert in and then move on. If you want to move on to another topic, I get the last word on the subject that I'm an expert in. Bro, you okay. don't get the juice like that, bro. Come down. Um, so the, um, the, all, of the, all of that stuff that you were just, saying, that you were just nattering about um, has no, you know, we understand how sound waves work, right? We can do experiments on the propagation of sound waves through solids in the laboratory. In fact, we get rocks from volcanoes, we put them at high pressure and temperature, and then we run seismic waves through them. So you claim that we don't know what's happening with the seismic with seismic properties at depth is untrue because we do do experimental recreations of process of um, conditions inside the earth using rocks that come from inside the earth. So that's just nonsense. Um, and the other stuff that you um, flouted sounded like sounded like um, sounded absolutely correct. There isn't a seismologist who on the planet who would disagree with you, and none of them, um, save for your anonymous friend who has no publications that we can that we can reference, um, uh, will agree okay. with you about your conclusions. You know, okay, and cool. Now if, we're going to move on. And if one final point, if seismology is completely useless, completely inaccurate and utterly without value, why is anybody man. paid to study it? The straw man fallacy. I, I didn't say it was completely without value. It just built upon a begging the question fallacy. So affirming the consequent reification fallacy. All right. Absolutely so anyway, not. we tested the flat earth. Again, you're going no, to have to shut up with this nonsense. You straw man the flat earth. There is, no, there is no flat earth model that can explain the observations. And until there is, you're useless and irrelevant. You straw man the flat earth. So no, on now. no, no, no. This is how science works, mate. Science is about explaining what we observe in reality. Flat earth cannot explain yeah. what we observe in reality. And when, when confronted on the subject, it just goes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can't explain it. So what? What does Projection. that matter? Well, it That's actually matters. Did. It actually matters, mate, because we do think we get results in the real world. Lives depend 
on seismic models and tsunami propagation models being accurate. And billions of dollars of infrastructure depend on them as well. And people pay good money to understand the processes that drive them and how quickly okay. they arrive. Okay. And you don't get to say all useless. No, I pointed specifically why I was wrong. We can move on, but like just it's begging the question wrong. of the model. <laughs> You, you don't get to say it's just wrong and then move on. No, if you I want to I move specified on, why just it was wrong. up and move on. Well, you're the one that's actually avoiding substantive specificity like it's the plague. You know, like I'm bringing up specific really, problems. I'm the only it. one that brought in. I'm the only one that okay. has produced. I'm the only one that okay. has produced measurements. No, actually, I just showed, uh, I, I, you said less than 1% had to correct you in front of the whole room, and now you're pretending you've been teaching me. So, hey, we can move on now. So, it, like, there's something called ground wave radio transmissions, okay? Yeah. And so we can shoot them from, according to the military, a uh, uh, three-meter tall tower, a horizontal line of sight propagation over uh, 800 kilometers, right, from like a three-kilometer, so, I mean, a three-meter tall Citation. tower. Yeah, sure. I'll drop a citation. So the point is that I want to see if you can answer the question, which is that if we shoot the propagation, I actually showed this on my last debate, right? The military document. If I shoot horizontal ground wave propagation from 10 feet up and I shoot it 497 miles, right? How could I reach my target almost 500 miles away? If there should be 32 miles of vertical earth curvature blocking the horizontal propagation of the radio wave. Wave guiding. Wave guiding. Yes. Okay. You want to explain to me what what you're what you're attempting to say? Um, I am attempting to say that there are physical principles that we can use to guide waves. Like what? In this particular in this particular case, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're. But, it's okay to say you don't that, know. But that but that doesn't that doesn't so, um, but that doesn't mean that um and again you haven't shared the reference with me so how would i have any idea that what you're even claiming is real well it's funny because i dropped 10 references with you that you ignored but now you want to reference so well you only want to reference whenever you want to try to come at flat earth it seems you want to ignore the direct and specific refutations of your like misrepresentations they are minor imprecisions no and it's 40 you know, isn't and, and, minor and, 40% for a tiny fraction of Earth's mass, you know, um, for, a, yeah. for a geographically limited and very depth limited um, layer within the Earth. We um, have huge it, discrepancies low down as well. So we're not going to go back into that because you're just going to make stuff up. You brought it up, mate. You brought it up. Um, yeah, I was, so I was making you, a point. If you don't want to discuss it, um, don't mention it. I said but you again, ignored all the other... Again, no... Again, they are minor. In, they, these Did you are watch my presentation? Well, apparently you want to talk about seismology the entire time. You brought it up again. No. You don't get to just bring up stuff and pretend that, oh, no, it's it settled this way. Okay? If you're going to reference the seismic stuff, we'll go back to the seismic stuff. Okay? No, I think I if already If you don't want to talk about that. the seismic stuff, don't mention the seismic stuff. Well, I know there's going to be like like really zealous people in the chat that no matter what, they're going to say you're right because you appeal to your PhD over and over. But people that can critically think will hear that actually I had to correct you and people you were wrong. Who are and people who it's are, whatever. Who it's a begging the question think, fallacy. We can. Yeah, how do the radio waves work? That you're delusional. How do the radio um, waves this work? Is, this is the this is the simple this is the simple reality, which it you are Add delusional. On. You Add imagine on. that you have you're an not very professional. Um, I'm not at work. Am I at work? Well, Am I getting you know, paid? You're for in this? an intellectual setting and you're being no, I'm not. I'm talking to a delusional man. Self projection. I'm so <laughs> it, basically, this is the thing. But I have observations from reality. You haven't even given me the you, reference that you allege you, claims the phenomenon. You literally said, and I quote, we don't make actual observations. We make calculations you observations assuming of the time. model. I showed you observations of tsunami travel times. Are those observations? Well, the tsunami travel times don't help our, you out. Because our seismic waves, our seismic waves observation is the propagation of rally waves observed and measured. Yes, it is. Well, they're no, they're not. They're not directly observed as they go pressure through the waves, entire pressure. No. Size rally waves don't go through the Earth. That's why they're surface waves. So they're surf. Yeah, the surface waves anomalies I've already brought up to you that there are. Yes, I cited minor, it in the chat. Minor anomalies. They don't get you to. You they can't explain 
why it goes around the earth multiple times from epicenter to antipode and back again. You didn't explain they that. They don't always you do that. Even, they do. What, well, pardon? They don't always do that. No, because the earthquake isn't big or isn't always big enough. But for earthquakes, what about the ones that are enough, really big and still don't do that? They're too deep. Oh, so, so basically, wave, they always do something wave, that they don't do. Rally wave, rally wave formation is dependent is a result of P and S wave interactions at the surface that create these sort of accordion style deformations. They're the most damaging seismic waves, by the way, um, and they propagate once at the surface and created, they propagate around the surface. They don't return to depth. Dude, so let's they, move but on. They only, don't... But they, no, you raised it. You raised the question. And now I'm answering your question. And now you can't. You did. You you brought up size. You, know what you, read, question, you lied about rally waves. You lied about, um, uh, you know, and you're trying to, you're trying to pretend <laughs> like minor inconsistencies are um, are somehow enough to invalidate the entirety of science. You just it's keep not. trying to say stuff to make it sound bad. You're like, oh, minor discrepancy. No, I said 40%. There's all kinds of surface wave anomalies. Different. You interrupt incessantly. Even, you straw man incessantly. You constantly ad hom. You're not good at the base. I'm you sorry. You can't go two sentences without lying. Okay, so again, projection. So can you explain the radio waves? Like No. Like, Okay, so you can't explain the radio waves. What about how in the, the magnetic field isn't symmetrical as the globe earth the globe earth model would predict? The globe that earth model does not predict that the I, I studied geomagnetism for my honors in mathematics. The, the Earth's magnetic field there is absolutely no claim of um, symmetricality for Earth's magnetic field. That is absolute nonsense. Um, cool. Where's the cite, cite cite your source that yeah. tells me you know, cite your scientific paper that tells yeah. me that Earth's magnetic field should be symmetrical. Yeah, I will. It's, yeah. There's a paper right here all about the uh, asymmetry of the magnetic field from Harvard and how they're using supercomputers to try to fix the discrepancy. Now, of course, it's not trying to be perfect. Symmet it is not supposed to be perfectly symmetrical, but it's supposed to be overall symmetrical. It's a geodynamo model coming from the center of a sphere, so the northern and southern hemisphere should be symmetrically dispersing from the center, no, that, but, it's not, that's entirely, but it's not. That's, that's so, entirely, that's entirely dependent on the conductivity of the material in the um, in the mantle, uh, oh, an uneven, no. an uneven yeah. distribution of conductive material in the mantle will result in gravitational anomalies. You're also oh. ignoring the um, you're also ignoring and while a lot of geodynamo researchers like to assume that the mantle just isn't conductive, it actually is. Um, and we you wow we, yes. Well, you're going against all the scientists. <laughs> so the point is that. I just now broke down that it should be symmetrical. It's not symmetrical. And they actually say you that they would claim, have to... You claim that it should be symmetrical, but again, you're delusional with it. Where no, is Harvard your evidence? Claims it. Harvard Where, claims it. Well, you haven't shown it, have you? I'm about to... You you're you're uh, constantly you're asking for citations. I have to go find each one of them, man. The point is that you've offered no citations no, other than what you had in your presentation. Show us, show us the citation. Show okay. us the citation. Okay, I have to find it. I have tons of files. But the point is that you can deny it, but everyone else at home can go look up asymmetry of the geomagnetic field based on the geodynamo model, and they'll see I'm telling the truth. And so actually, for the, are you claiming no, no, that the no, mantle... No, 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 Wait, no, no, out. No, You're claiming no. that the mantle's causing it. So are you claiming that the Southern Hemisphere has an, an entirely different distribution within the mantle? Yes, in fact, there's a sub-Pacific anomaly. Most of the it's called the South Atlant Atlantic anomaly, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what's what's in the southern hemisphere's mantle that's making it so much different than the north. I don't know. Right. You okay. Know, so, so this, but, but you know, it, you see, you need to demonstrate. You have made the claim, the the claim that um, all scientists, all geomagnetists, believe that Earth's magnetic field should be symmetric. Prove oh, that. Why are you always straw manning? Prove that. Just prove your straw man. So first of all, I never said all scientists anything. I'm not fallacious, so I don't say things like that. That's ignorant. All scientists don't think any one thing. Only like globe proponents that gaslight say that. But the point is that based on the fundamental understanding of what a geodynamo model is, if you understood a dynamo process and how you actually yes, allegedly... Yeah, the there's no, there's no right, guarantee the of symmetry the, the dynamo. I couldn't hear what he was saying. 
So they, they claim that there's a dynamo process which has convection currents that come from the core that create the magnetic field. And so since the north and the south aren't symmetrical, they say there must be something going on in the core that we don't fully understand that's causing the southern hemisphere to be significantly weaker than the north. It has nothing to do with the mantle. Um, well, you know, I'm, I am your evidence, the evidence. So you've, you've pulled, you've pulled a Swifty here. Your assertion was um, in your presentation that because there are asymmetries in Earth's magnetic field, therefore the Earth must be flat. Um, no, that's not true. Um, I can tell you just from ju and just from variations in mantle conductivity, there should be asymmetries. And your claim that there shouldn't be asymmetries is false. Your claim that the paper you're referencing um, suggests that um, the geodynamo is model is completely wrong, or that the flat Earth, um, uh, uh, or the yeah, the Trauma. northern hemisphere. So um, <laughs> no delusion. Your delusion. You asked me to cite the papers. I just dropped three of them in the chat. And for Yes, mate, and you know, um, none of them prove that none of them will claim that the earth is flat, right? Throw them in. I never claimed that they do claim any the of these. Flat, so. Do any of these, based on do any of these papers that you just dropped, claim that the earth is say that on this basis we we conclude that the observed geomagnetic field is inconsistent with um, uh, a spherical earth? It's inconsistent with the spherical any of them earth say that? Geo geodynamo model i just cited it so no, just they, so the they, they, just so the audience knows i'm not lying about citing it because you're just ignoring them so there's the southern hemisphere geomagnetic field the new insights into secular variation and geodynamo space science reviews 206 207 through 233 we have the southern hemisphere ionospheric asymmetry and total electron content and its relationship to large-scale berkland currents and we have the southern hemisphere ge geomagnetic anomaly evidence for a hemispherical difference in core mantle boundary heat flow so there you go. There's three of the papers, and they can listen back to the stream yeah. and see that I'm yes. obviously actually them, just speaking accurately them, about your model that you don't understand. No, this is, you are you are so delusional. the The idea that the observations don't agree with a particular model um, requires that the model be revised. Fine, but that doesn't make the model completely useless and in, in, and in need of being scrapped, which is what you're suggesting. You're suggesting that no spherical model um, with a geodynamo in it can explain the observations. That is not the conclusion that any of these papers reach. What these None of them papers have a say, conclusion, Mr. For Q&A, guys. What, Mr. For Q &A. Yes, they yeah. do. It's it, it will be in the bit of the paper labeled you bet? conclusion. You want to bet? Almost certainly, yeah. Yeah, so they, they admit they can't even use supercomputers to mathematically fix this problem yet. They have no idea why because, of yeah. course, based on the geo, based on the geodynamo model, the core should be evenly distributed on all sides of it. So it should be symmetrical on the outside as well because convection according currents to supposedly... The, according to the model it doesn't work. Now. It doesn't work. So the radio transmissions, you had no answer for. You don't understand the magnetic field. You basically just conceded that the well, waves have, don't ever uh, go around Antarctica... So we can move on to another point in the last minute. I don't no, think we really have time. you claim that you claim that tsunami waves never went around Antarctica, and you never proved any. You never provided any Don't observational negatives. validation. Um, uh, you, you never provided any observational validation for that whatsoever. In you, my presentation. Um, um, no, you didn't. You I showed a it. picture of a very big wave yes, of in nineteen sixty. A wave. Um, you know, and a tsunami. A tsunami. Basis. Yes, you're claiming on that basis that all tsunamis behave the same way as that tsunami. No, I'm saying I, their location, their mechanism, and their um, uh, and their magnitude. That is a that is not a valid citizen. No, but syllogism. if you understood how fa if you understand how logic worked, I can't prove a negative. So I'm saying on the evidence I've seen, I've never which seen where way, they go around Antarctica. You even gave an excuse way, as. Please stop. You gave an excuse as to why they didn't go around Antarctica. You no, said I that there's a reason, and then mechanism. I said. Okay, if you have evidence that they wrap around Antarctica, please let me know, and then I'll look into it. Um, my claim is that the propagation of tsunamis in all circumstances is very consistent with our models for tsunami propagation. That's my claim. They're not. Though. And you have to go into the and scientific that's literature. that's time. You know, the, I just want to add one more thing. None of the papers that he's referenced say what he say what he claims they say. Uh, again, 
this is just what? delusional. That, that our models, that the models of the geodynamo process are not consistent with observations requires that they be modified. Fine. But none of them are going to say, therefore, the geodynamo doesn't exist or therefore the Earth is not spheroidal. The fact that scientific models have imprecisions in them, as I said, all models are wrong. Some models are useful, except for the flat Earth model. It's not useful. It is never useful. Um, yeah, it is. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's a bit of an overstatement. It, it can be used on very short length scales or to grossly simplify the mathematics that you deal or with. Or explain all celestial phenomena and earthquakes and tsunamis. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the Q&A, shall we, gentlemen? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so let me go ahead and switch over my graphics here and put 30 minutes on the clock. So this is about how much time we have before 9. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, $10 Super Chats and upper what it's going to get priority tonight. So uh, please be understanding of that. And I'm going to put 10, uh, 30 minutes on the clock right now. There we go. And the first question coming in from... Sorry, got to go all the way up to this. It's a long list. I uh, hope we can get through all of them. Um, okay, from Arcane Visions for ten dollars, they say to Austin, "Can you explain the three-body problem and why supercomputers are unable to mathematically model just the orbits of the Earth, Sun, and Moon under current heliocentric theory?" Uh, yeah, because the dynamic relationship assumed, which is built upon the kinematic and geometric assumptions, the mass distribution relationship can't even be mathematically theorized. So they have to break it all down into two body equations then try to get uh, temporary solutions and then build an overall assumption. So, yeah, even supercomputers can't make your model work and it's all built upon math. Then it seems likely that maybe your model is wrong. Yeah. So um, the model is we're not going to be able to have time to have everybody. Uh, to respond to both questions, to each question. Okay. So I'm sorry, but we're just going to have to have the person who's been asked uh, respond. I'll try to get uh, any questions for you, uh, Tony, uh, up to the top too as well. Um, from Coconut Cream Pie for ten dollars, they say, "Where is the sun?" However, to answer this question, we need two. We need two axioms first. One, the sun exists, and two, the sun is a higher elevation than Mount Everest. Use evidence for your answer. I'm not I sure who that's for. Are... So you can both respond to that one. Okay, well, we can bounce radar waves off the sun. We can also point to the fact that after a uh, coronal mass ejection, it takes three days for solar storms to reach Earth. Um, if, the, if the sun is local, why does that take so long? Why can we predict um, solar storms before they get here? Okay, so yeah, you think that's you you assume you send radio waves to the sun and think that somehow proves it's 93 million miles away. That's absurd to me. And why, why do the radio waves take a certain amount of distance, even if that was true, which it's not, by the way? They increased an entire new method of interpretation whenever they allegedly bounce radar off the way. You should stop just reading, believing everything on McToon.net. But anyway, uh, there would be a different medium than what you assume. And yeah, so the sun is local, but it has an apparent position based on what we perceive. So yes, the sun exists. Yes, it seems to be higher than Mount Everest, but it's also an and within an azimuth grid of observability so we can only see so far we have a visual curved limit to our space our visual space and so we see an apparent position we don't always we don't see the actual position of some physical tangible sun and uh, understanding this fact you can explain every position of the sun all throughout every single year uh on a flat earth what right, i so find Tony, notable, I got a question for you Tony, find... Tony, sorry sorry Tony, Tony, i'm sorry no uh for you for ten dollars the question is for you it says if we know the mass distance velocity of the sun moon and earth how is it supercomputers can't even mathematically model the orbits aka three-body problem and how can heliocentrists claim to have a working model okay so the um issue is mass distributions within earth and within the moon um these are um, not constant um and they cause uh perturbations in the gravitational attraction between earth and moon in particular um, that's what causes the instabilities that um, that your um, interlocutor, that my interlocutor, is asking for. Um, uh, but uh, I find that irrelevant to the topic of conversation. The topic of conversation is the shape of the Earth. Um, and what I find um, interesting about Witsit's answer to his last question was that he made a lot of declarative statements about what's happening, and he produced 
absolutely zero observational evidence um, for it. Didn't even reference observational evidence. Um, uh, you know, we are talking about the shape of the Earth. I have presented the evidence, the spherical distance formula, the propagation of Rayleigh waves, the propagation of, um, of atmospheric pressure waves. Um, these are observational, um, observational phenomena that are completely unexplainable on a flat Earth. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. From Arcane Visions, once again, for $10. Thank you so much, Arcane. Uh, they say, to Tony, once again, Bay of Fundy at 6,128 square miles has a mean tide range of 38.4 feet, which, uh, which equates to moving 413 trillion pounds of water with that large of a pull force. Can people also jump higher at high tide? Um, no, what's happening at the Bay of Fundy is that the bathymetry and topography there are funneling the, the tide so that it, it's moving a broad wave, but it moves into a funnel and it gets sort of um, lifted up. That's why um, the inertia of the, um, of the water as it is responding to tidal forcing um, brings it into this funnel. Um, the water level is, is rises that dramatically because of um, bathymetric and um, uh, and topographic effects, um, and this is something that flat earthers refuse to take into account in their discussions of of tides. Got it. Thank you so much. Once again, from Arcane Visions for ten dollars. Thank you again, Arcane Visions. Uh, Tony, I weigh a rock every hour during new moon when pull of sun slash moon should be strongest since they are aligned, and saw no change in weight twenty three point seven three grams. Why does the sun slash moon pull water, but not my rock? Uh, the problem there is the accuracy of your instrument. Um, you know, the um, tidal effect is not um, uh, is not sufficiently large to be picked up with only um, uh, two decimal places. Uh, I uh, work maintaining a superconducting gravimeter, and um, superconducting gravimeters are more than accurate enough to um, uh, to detect tidal forcing you can see it um, see it come across we also see um, solid earth tides um, in the GPS records and we also see loading due to atmospheric tides so um, flat earth approximate flat earth um, arguments that are based solely on water um, don't hold any weight the gravity is a gravity the tidal effect on the solid earth and the tidal effect on, say, test masses inside the uh, superconducting gravimeter are detectable, measurable, and agree with the theory. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, next super chat comes in from Nick for ten dollars. Thank you so much, Nick. They are a critic of you, Tony. They want to say, did you miss Austin's last debate that he created a lot of flat earthers with his demeanor, and tonight you did the same, and that you did a disservice to the globe? How do you respond to that? I respond to that by saying, yeah. Got it. Thank you so much. And then from Arcane Visions, once again for $10, they say, to Tony, between solar noon and midnight at equator, the speed a person experiences would change by 2,074 miles per hour, Earth rotating with orbit versus against, yet we can't feel it, measure it, or detect it. Please explain. So um, we have a system for um, measuring the um, accelerations that we feel, but if that system were um, so sensitive that it picked up the rotation of the Earth and um, other things, it would be barely useful. It would, it would not be useful at all. It, it provides no evolutionary advantage for us to be able to feel accelerations that small. Um, they are tiny um, and, uh, and our body just isn't sensitive, you know, our uh, our, our the the systems we use to detect acceleration simply aren't sensitive enough to detect changes of that magnitude, but we can detect them with um, uh, with instruments that are sensitive enough. We can build instruments that are sensitive enough. This is one of the advantages we have over people who lived, say, ten thousand years ago, is that we can build vastly more sensitive instruments and we can measure and observe the effects. Um, uh, and demonstrate that they're occurring. All right. Thank you so much. I'll let you both respond to this one. Uh, Shane Taft is saying for nine ninety nine. thank you so much, Shane. They say that this is why, this right here, is why every day there are more flat earthers and less globe earthers. Yeah, yeah it's like the number one thing I get is that uh, the way that people defend the globe just comes off a bit fallacious and uh, it, it shouldn't be needed if the earth really is a globe, but 
Yeah, that's all good. That's why that's why I do this. If somebody's delusional enough to think that um, which had presented any observational evidence for his model, I can't help him. Let's watch the presentation back. Got it. Thank you both so much. From Troll Nerd for ten dollars, they say thank you. So thank you so much, Troll Nerd. They say to Witsit, it seems to me you don't understand, like most non-scientific people, that terms like anomaly and theory have different meanings in a scientific context than in a colloquial language. Anomaly means it doesn't the data set doesn't match the predicted data set and it needs to be further explained and expanded upon. Uh forty percent discrepancy is means your model's wrong, okay? It means that your current understanding of that specific phenomena is incorrect. That's just the way it is. Now, I, I listed a lot of them, but we would have had to have like impatience and not incessant interrupting to go through the specifics of each one. And it clearly just wasn't like a viable, uh, you know, option right now. But yeah, anyway, it's all good to each their own. Uh, the moderator did good, by the way. I'm not taking shots at you. I'm just saying like it clearly was a little bit way too heated to work to have to go through like the depths of all these different specifics. But um, I encourage people to listen to the terms I said and go look into it. You'll be surprised that it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz curtain that is size up seismology. I, I did see a lot of comments in the chat about my moderation, and I will say that I am all for letting the debaters just dictate the narrative of this debate. If they want to have a dumpster fire that's on them if they want to have a nice cordial conversation that is also on them it is not my job to control that um thank you so much uh for from arcane visions for ten dollars uh tony a tony a plane seven miles high is carried along with spin of earth how does fluid atmosphere carry a solid in sync with earth spinning seven miles below what altitude must be reached for this to no longer occur Okay, so the fluid dynamics of, um, uh, of the atmosphere, the atmosphere has been entrained by um, Earth's topography for four billion years. Um, so the um, so that ex can you repeat the question? Because I I think that that's just an sure. answer to it. There's there you know uh, uh, um, it, it, unless it's acted upon by another force, it's just going to keep on doing that. So do you want me repeat it? Repeat the or question. You got it. Yeah, uh, a plane seven miles high is carried along with the spin of the Earth. How does fluid atmosphere carry a solid in sync with Earth spinning seven miles below? What altitude must be reached for this to no longer occur? Okay, well, I think that the um, uh, that the uh, there are multiple levels on which that question and on, on which that question is kind of meaningless. Um, as you go higher, the atmosphere gets thinner and less able to. But the um, but it's not a question of the atmosphere um, carrying the airplane. The airplane has its own inertia when it takes off and applies a force relative to the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is moving. Um, uh, you know, by 100 kilometres, the atmosphere is fairly thin, though atmospheric drag effects um, are significant. You know, so at 200 kilometres, atmospheric drag effects um uh, basically pull your orbits out of satellite out of um your satellites out of orbit so all right thank you so much um, from flanker 420 for ten dollars they say i am an astrophotographer and amateur astronomer why can i see spherical planets and moons with my optical telescope i also track the sun that strays the same that stays the same size all day how is this possible yeah so for one, you just saying it's a sphere doesn't actually mean anything. Um, and you normally have to layer like hundreds of pictures on top of each other to get any type of real resolution. Um, that's what actually happens. But it doesn't even matter if there were spheres up there. It doesn't prove that the Earth's a sphere. It's insane to think that. Um, and when it comes to the angular size change of the sun, well, uh, we have an azimuthal grid of vision. So uh, I, I, I'm not going to share my screen, obviously, Q&A. We don't have a lot of time. But um, you can go look at the uh walter bislin's model so thanks walter and uh walter bislin flat earth model you'll see that as the sun moves away from the observer in that azimuthal grid of vision the sun stays the same size because it's reaching your curved space visual limit and this of course is the same thing used for time and day and stellarium within you know even the globe paradigm that's how we actually uh map out the sky we take an azimuth and altitude so within that uh celestial hemisphere you would have a curved visual space limit and so you would only perceive the sun on that limit so it would stay the same distance from you and you wouldn't see an angular size change other than throughout the year which is what we observe all right got it thank you, you so have much any observations, from, you have any uh, observations 
to uh, that, I'm sorry. That, that question no, was Tony, for Tony, I'm sorry. Was it? Hmm. It wasn't addressed to Witsit. You're right. Yeah, clearly, but it was. But Proceed. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so do you have any observational evidence for what you just said? Uh, yeah, yeah. Everything that we've ever uh, done when it comes to taking measurements of the sky, we take an azimuth and an altitude, and it gives us a celestial hemisphere, and time and date solarium also use that. So we all angles ever taken to the celestial objects, yeah. I, I missed your observations. All you, you, right. you celestial claimed, angles. You, you just made a okay. you just made a series. Let's of not go all around around on this you again. Didn't, you didn't uh, produce any observations. From <laughs> coconut cream pie for ten dollars, they say another question: What and where are the stars in the night sky? Only axiom: the nighttime stars lighter. The, the nighttime stars light is fainter than sunlight. Well, yeah. Who was the question for? Both I of missed us. it. What so and I'm where just... are the stars at the uh, in the night sky? I, I believe that's for you, what's it? Because they're asking yeah. where the stars go in the daytime, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we like the stars move over top of us, and you can only see the stars from so far away. Of course, the sun lights up just a portion of the earth as we observe for all recorded history. And so you you know, light's obviously gonna make the stars less visible. They move over top of us, uh, and then they reach your limit of perspective, which is curved visual space, which comes back to our azimuth or grid of vision. So just to say this real fast, so everyone understands you have an azimuth, which will be like your horizontal directional angle that you take. You have your zenith, which is directly above you and then you have your uh altitude angles right coming up from that horizontal up to the zenith you have altitude angles and then you can continue that behind you this is how we get positions of this this is how we map out the sky right and we get a coordinate system a grid system and that gives us an azimuthal grid of vision and so that's just the limit of our perspective and that's why we can't see the stars forever they move away from us and they're beyond our limit of perspective okay my got it okay is... well, let's move on shall we we have a, about one question per minute that we have left in the okay. q a uh, so we really have to move on from arcane visions for $10. They say to Tony per NASA radius of earth is 13 miles greater at equator than at poles. Does a flight from Finland over the equator have to increase altitude to make it over this increased radius? Why or why not? Okay. So planes fly at um, planes when they take off, they set up, they configure um, the um, their wings and the various flaps that they've got so that they will stay at an equal pressure. Um, uh, if they go above that pressure, they lose lift and they sink back. Um, uh, so um, they'll just stay at the same pressure um, altitude as they go along, unless there's some pilot intervention. So, um, and the um, pressure, uh, that ISO pressure, um, isobar um, altitude, um, will stay the same height above the surface of the Earth as you move along, roughly speaking. Um, but as long as they follow an isobar, they don't need to do anything to get over that um, over that uh, um, bump over the equatorial bulge. You're muted, brother. Thank you. Uh, from Arcane Visions, <coughs> excuse me. From Arcane Visions for ten dollars to Tony, if Pluto were the size of a BB that's 0 0.73 inches in diameter, the sun would be 8.45 feet in diameter with a distance separating the two of 6.8 miles. Is it believable to you that gravity holds that BB in orbit 6.8 miles away? Yes. Well, I mean, you can't, you can't do that calculation, um, but, you know, the, the sort of, yes, uh, the, the the gravitational just the gravitational forces involved just scale down. So if there was nothing else around, if that was the only configuration, if those were the only two bodies you had, you had, yes, that would be the gravitational configuration you'd reach. Got it. Thank you so much. From T Baggins for ten dollars to uh, not sure yet. How do airplanes fly hundreds of miles straight forward without consistently and routinely dipping their noses down to compensate for the curvature of the Earth? I just explained this. They're following isobaric. They're fi they're following an isobaric um, uh, altitude, so they are configured so that automatically, if they if they go above the isobar, they'll lose lift and they'll just drop back onto the isobar. So by configuring their um, by configuring their wings and their flaps and 
um, various other controllers um, appropriately, um, they can um, just follow the isobar without any intervention. Um, they do not need to adjust for curvature of earth because the isobar curves um, naturally. And they do this actually right. adjusting horizontally. We had to move on. Like oh, I'm sorry. Layer, awesome. So. I'm sorry. Uh, from Earth is Life for ten dollars to you, Witsit. When did you become a seismologist? Oh, I, I'm not a seismologist, but I just know that people that get a degree, they think that they can just pretend that they have it all figured out. But in reality, they have all kinds of presuppositions, reifications. When you're talking about things thousands of miles deeper than we have access to, that's called pseudoscience. And it's cool if you want to try to figure it out, but don't don't misrepresent it like you know about it. So, I mean, all I had to do is go like look into it a little bit. And there are well-known discrepancies and anomalies that don't match the predicted value, do not have current explanations. I was just pointing them out because, you know, the globe typically misrepresents the efficacy of their model. That's all I'm doing. Can you, find, can to be you name, name? Okay, from can Arcane name, Visions you know, for $10, they say to Tony, Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, has a diameter slash distance ratio equivalent to viewing a dime from 375 miles. Can a light source the size of a dime viewed from 375 miles be as bright as Sirius? Um, I regard the question as um, largely meaningless. I mean, I don't, I, I don't care for this. Um, yeah, if Got it's it. as bright as a star, sure. If you set off a fusion bomb um, and you have a straight line to it, um, yeah, you're going to see it. Um, it's a, it's an insanely hot. You know, stars we can tell from their spectrographic and from spectrographic analysis are producing their energy through fusion. We can also detect the byproducts of this fusion. Um, when we point um, neutrino detectors at them. For instance, we can follow the trajectory of the sun as it goes around, you know, as it, as it appears from some, to somebody on Earth, as it goes underground and around and back up. We can track it using neutrino detectors. Um, so the claim that it always stays above the Earth is easily um, invalidated. Um, but yes, if you have a bright enough dime at however much distance that is, you will see it. The photons will get to you. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we now have uh, more than one Super Chat per minute left. So send any Super Chats further at your own peril. Uh, we have way more than enough to get through the next 10 minutes, so we're going to try to get through them as, as fast as we can. Once again, uh, from T. Baggins for $10, they say to Tony, uh, please uh, calm down. Uh, why do lakes have tides? Why do lakes not have tides to the same degree like the oceans? Shouldn't the moon have the same effect on bodies of water? That's strange. Um, yeah, it's a matter of uh, length. Uh, wave um, wave height is a function of how um, how long a distance you can apply the force over. Um, uh, so the reality is that the um, uh, the the reality is that that affects the size of the size of the waves that you can have. But also, um, and this is this was what made me laugh when um, Witsit was talking about tides when he said that gravitation, the gravitational effect of the moon is constant. Tides only occur because the gravitational attraction isn't constant. But over a small distance like a lake, um, it, it is pretty constant. Um, so the, um, the distance from one side of the lake to the moon to the other side of the lake is not that big. Um, so that's why you don't see large, um, large tidal influences on small bodies of water. Got it. And then from Zaraxin, Zaraxarin for 10 euros. Thank you so much, Zaraxarin. Uh, they ask to Witsit, uh, x-rays show the skeleton. If there is a broken bone, there is an anomaly. So in your opinion, x-rays are always false. Can you give a paper on how P slash S waves work on flat earth? Uh yeah. So first of all, I didn't say that the moon's gravity was always constant. I said it would be an even distribution relative to its position over the earth. Uh, in addition to that, like I, I the point is that you're cl he claimed in his presentation, because I'm trying to keep it really quick, that it always works. It doesn't always work at all whatsoever. No, of course, That's you have certain anomalies. Of course, you have certain anomalies. You can go watch it back. Word for word said always works, and it doesn't. There's huge anomalies up to 40%, and there's way more we didn't get into. So it's not. It's about the fact that it's claimed to. In, it's invoked a claim that it's proof of the Earth being a globe when it clearly is not. It's not even understood. All right. Thank you so much. From Cool Lambo for twenty dollars Australian, I think. Uh, Austin eggs are one dollar at one store, but two dollars at another. What shape is the Earth? What? 
<laughs> I totally clogged it. All right. The, the Earth is stationary Sky- topographical plane out in another shape. Okay. From Sky Scion for $4.99. Uh, to, do- to PhD Tony. Uh, literally, be- literally became like... Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. They are um, criticizing you for your uh, demeanor once again. Um, Fantastic. Or no? Okay. Uh, Eric air pleading for $10 to wits it. Uh, please give the reference for the radio wave propagation that D- Dr. Tony asked for. Yeah, sure. I mean, he ignored all my citations. So yeah, well, you I'll, drop I'll, this one. I'll drop it. I'll drop it in the stream. All of the things that you put in the private chat and um, okay. I can put it in a document or something, whatever James wants to do as far as sharing it with the, uh, the audience later. Um, I'll ask cool. him about that afterwards. Yeah. Cool. Um, or if you could drop it, I know there's like a discord. I can try to get them in there, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I showed it in my last. I showed it in on screen on my last debate as well. So, okay, from Earth is Life for ten dollars. They say, uh, "What's it?" I'm, I'm sure this means what's it. Do you agree with this statement? Sydney and Johannesburg are six thousand eight hundred and sixty-three miles apart on flat Earth. No, not necessarily. It's hard, it's hard to actually distance, verify. What distance are they apart? I don't know. Okay. From well, that useful, yeah, from your model's RS, been proven wrong, so chill out. From RS385 for ten dollars, how do you explain planes and boats going around the earth if your world is flat? If the world is flat, what are the edges of the world made of? Okay, I actually covered that in the in the freaking presentation. No, Circumnavigation east to west is just going around the north. The fact that people still ask that question is insane. No one goes north to south around a globe earth. That never happens. They claim it does, but it's it just does. a perfect example. Stop interrupting, man. You're, you have impulse control issues. It's just a perfect example of how they misrepresent the truth. If you look at it, they actually dip over just a portion of Antarctica, pop back up. They never go over and circumnavigate north to south. So I wonder why there's so much lying going on. I, I don't really know. So yeah, just circumnavigate north to south seems pretty simple to me. And actually, it's been proven that sellers in the south are normally off by roughly 14 to 15 miles a day using the globe model, but we won't talk about that. What is right. off by 14 to 15 miles Sellers okay. in the south. Let's move on. From Earth's Still? Life for ten dollars, they ask, "Why does Walter's Walter Blisson Bislin? I'm sorry. Yeah, why yeah, does Bislin. Walter Bislin's flat Earth model clearly state that in order for the model to work, light has to bend in an impossible way?" Because he realized that he couldn't actually show it's impossible to map out the sky on a flat Earth, so he had to come up with some type of way it would be uh, refuted, and he claimed that the light would have to physically bend based on refraction by strawmanning a position that he made up, and he put arbitrary stars in random positions that he also made up, not using real stellarium data, which works perfectly. Then he claimed that they would have to curve from his arbitrarily placed stars, and in reality, the position is that the light isn't physically bending, it's just an optical effect based on the azimuthal grid of vision, and every single celestial object can be perfectly mapped out. So the better question is, why did Walter Bislin have to straw man egregiously lie based upon arbitrary play stars to claim it wouldn't work on a flat earth? All right. And then from Thomas Yates for $10, they say, why does every single globe proponent melt down? Um, They're asking you to. Um, Because it's because it's frustrating that Witsit can just um, barefaced lie like he just did. Um, He just gets up here. He um, launches into polysyllabic torrents. That his um, followers, um, uh, that his followers lap up uncritically, and then he makes bold-faced lies about the status of the scientific literature, claiming that the spher- spherical model doesn't work, claiming that the spherical distance formula has been debunked, claiming that seismology is a load of junk, um, uh, claiming that seismology is pseudoscience. He cannot name a single scientific institution on the face of the planet that will agree with him, nor can he name a single scientist on the face of the planet that will agree with him. Yet he, and nor does he have any training in science, yet he has the term temerity to um, uh, to uh, cast dispersions on hundreds of thousands of people who work very hard um, at their profession every day and Um, because he knows that they all prove him wrong. So he's coming from a position of complete ignorance, um, complete lack of qualifications, and he's just lying about my colleagues. Appeal to emotion in Adams. Okay. And uh, the last uh, over $10 super chat that we have is from Globe Merkers. They are asking me to mute debaters when they are interrupting people. And I would do that, except for that StreamYard does not allow me to do that. They are allowed to unmute themselves. So then it becomes a power struggle. And if that happens, then what I'm going to do is end up having to end these debates 
as soon as that happens. And I'm not going to do that. I don't know. I don't think you guys want that to happen. So let's just let people have their arguments how they want to have them. Shall we? Okay. Um, one minute left. We'll get one of these less than $10 Super Chats in from Sparky site for uh, five pounds. They say to Witsit, why don't you push the length contradiction nonsense anymore? Is it because you've been exposed to it? Is it because you've been exposed in yet another lie? Okay. Actually, all the people that exposed me, like FTFE, MC Tune, they got thoroughly dismantled. Bryant Myers, the right, the professor of physics, has fell off the face of the earth and stopped doing uh, YouTube about flat earth. He actually emailed me about it it's because I was completely correct. And length contraction is needed to explain the fringe shift that was missing relative to the sun and all the globers thing I'm talking about relative to the earth itself, because they don't understand it. So um, what I actually said about it is exactly what Einstein said about it in his 2015 and 16 published paper called the special and general theory of relativity. And it is that the uh, that the apparatus contracted just the right amount. That objects in motion contract, but you can't tell from that reference frame. You have to be outside that reference frame to notice. It contracted just the right amount to make the Earth look like it's stationary, and you just happen to not be able to detect that the Earth's in motion. I didn't stop bringing it up for any other reason other than I like to talk about a variance of subjects, and it seems the Globers were just bleeding out on the ground regarding that, so I just kind of gave them a break. So if Brian Myers supports you, why isn't he here? Arguing that the Earth is flat? Everything you say is a straw man. Why isn't he here? Why isn't he supporting your position? I didn't say he supported me. Oh, 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 oh okay. So you're cherry picking somebody's nonsense. Um, you're you're cherry picking somebody's <gasps> interpretation, and then you're. All right, we have to get going, y'all. It's uh, nine o'clock. I know Austin has to get out of here, so let's go ahead and uh, wrap it up, shall we? Uh, do you yeah. want to say bye to the audience real quick? I'll let you guys do that real quick, and then we'll uh, close it up. Yeah, you can go ahead first. Go ahead, like a quick, concise, like conclusion. If you want to, I'll stay around for that. All right, Tony, you got it. Anything you want to say? Um, yeah, you want. Um, so, Witsit was unable to address the distance formula and its accuracy when applied to seismic waves, um, uh, railways, um, uh, submarine cables. It's um, very accurate. I never claimed it was perfect. Um, he isn't able to explain rally waves and the fact that they propagate around Earth multiple times. He claims that minor anomalies will explain this. They don't. He was he claimed fallaciously that um, spherical Earth models are fatally flawed. They aren't. That's why seismologists still have jobs. They provide useful and meaningful results that are grounded in reality. Wits had spent most of this debate um, cherry picking from papers that he is not qualified to understand and misrepresenting their results as though they support a flat Earth when they absolutely do not. None of these authors would agree with Witsit's interpretation of their results. So okay. um, he is lying when he says that um, these things dismantle um, seismology or observational science. They do not. Um, it's okay. just a barefaced lie. Okay, we really want to get, uh, let him get out of here now. Yeah, I'll just say a couple real fast. Like, uh, just rewatch my presentation at the beginning. Notice the fallacies that I, fallacies that I said you knew would happen, and then just listen back to the to the, the debate. It's nothing but exactly what was in the presentation. And he admitted that you have to assume the globe model. You don't make direct observations with measurements or any type of instrument. That you just make calculative assumptions based on the model. He mis misrepresented all type of anomalies and discrepancies, and based on the lack of advocacy of the actual model, no rebuttal for any of the flat Earth evidence of long wave ground wave propagation, etc. So I encourage everyone to just look into it, research themselves and uh yeah hopefully we can continue to progress where it gets more and more cordial and it's not such a like taboo let's fight to the death type of conversation it's then stop okay. lying all right all right all right gentlemen thank you both so much for the spirited debate we really appreciate it thank you both you are the lifeblood of the show i want to thank all the moderators in the audience and everybody in the audience who's sending questions and super chats we really appreciate all of the discussion and all the comments and everything else um i also want to say thank you to james for creating this platform and um i think that's everybody else so uh, finally, share it if you want to spread it, uh, like it if you loved it, and subscribe. Once again, Christianity is is Christianity true? Stuart Connectly and Nadir Ahmed going to be the Thursday at 8 p.m. the 27th. And then Debate Con 3.1, April 22nd, Saturday in Fort Worth, Texas. Get your link. The link to the tickets is the uh, God, I can't talk tonight. The link to the tickets is in the description below. And as well as the debaters themselves. If you like what you heard from any of them, please feel free to click their links. We really encourage you to do that. So uh thank you once again, everybody. Have a great night. And remember to keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Have a great night. Peace.